This episode of Murderous Miners is brought to you by the State of Logic podcast. This is Murderous Miners, Killer Kids, bringing you the frightening and truly insane tales of children with the thirst to kill. Kindergarten through 12th grade murderers. True stories thoroughly researched. Join us weekly for new tales of parents' worst nightmares on Murderous Minors, Killer Kids. Episode number eight. Here we go again. This week is the 25th anniversary of the stunning abduction and murder of nearly three-year-old James Bulger from Liverpool, England, on February 12, 1993, by two 10-year-old boys. In anticipation, we collaborated with the Amazing Nature vs. Narcissism podcast, and it was nothing less than a treat. The link to the full episode is in the show notes, and I have started with a clip from that episode, followed by a quick report to bring you up to speed on this case. Thank you so much for listening, as always. Welcome back to Nature vs. Narcissism. I'm Heather, and today we have a special guest, War Baby from the Murders Miners podcast. Hello, everyone. <laughs> yeah, so this is a pretty famous case. It, it has had a lot of notoriety. Whenever children killers come up, you know, generally you will hear about the case of two-year-old James Bulger. Mm-hmm. He was abducted um on February 12, 1993, from the Strand Shopping Center in Liverpool, England. But the craziest part is that he was two years old and he was abducted by two 10-year-olds yeah. who then took him two and a half miles away, led him away on a journey, and they ended up murdering him on the train tracks a couple miles away. Yeah. And the only thing that keeps popping in my head, too, every time I think about this case or every time somebody talks about killer kids, I think of this case and that still image from the camera outside the mall where they're literally just holding his hand like walking him out as if he's with them they and they have ccv tv footage of the almost the entire two and a half miles that Mm -hmm. they walked with him and evidently they were spotted by and interacted with up to 38 people yeah i saw that that two and a half yeah on that two and a half mile trek it's insane yeah and some of them did get a feeling and did approach them Mm -hmm. but i mean that just shows you how manipulative these boys were they you know one lady and her daughter had had james bulger they were holding his hands and they were so close to the police station they're like we'll just take them but no the boys were like we got it yeah you know they didn't they say that they were his uh brothers and they were yeah, a couple people they told that, that he was the that he was their younger brother, and a couple people they told that he was lost, lost, and they were taken, and him to they get were help. walking, yeah, over to the police station, which really was right there, mm-hmm. and they really could have at any point just dropped him off there. They, you know, just been like, "Hey, we found this kid," and took off. You know what I mean? Right. But they didn't. It's it's just heartbreaking, and and the fact that. You know, once you get into this case a little bit more, you can tell that that was their entire intent the the whole time. They wanted to kill him. It's well, disturbing. they had to have because yeah. I mean, you there's just you can't imagine that it's be like it would be like okay for the first two miles we're leading you away from your mom. We're just thinking about playing, yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know. But the crazier part to me is how one ten year old can convince another ten year old to help him kill somebody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I found that really disturbing as well. Because they were just friends, right? Well, they were friends at that point. But previously to that, John Venables had been bullied by Robert Thompson. Oh, see, I didn't know that. I just thought that they were friends. like Because, you know, Robert Thompson, his background is a little bit more... Even though if you looked at the boys and the way they made it seem in trial and stuff it's hard to know which one to put them like who's the ringleader you know Mm -hmm. and they always thought it was thompson because in his interview he doesn't cry he really has no emotion right 
and he had a really dysfunctional family life growing up and a really hard family life. But John Venables, he was extremely emotional. He kept hugging the detectives and he, he kept saying, I don't want to say because that's the worst part. You know, everything they asked him, he didn't want to say because it was the worst part, you know. Mm -hmm. So they thought, oh, this other kid was the ringleader and he just led him along. But now that we know what's gone on in you know, and up till now, which we'll go over, mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to really be the case. Yeah, that's what I was kind of hoping that you would actually get into a little bit more than I, because the part that I, I know everything all the way up until the trial and what they were sentenced with, I don't know anything after, like after they were sentenced. Yeah, do you want to go over the trial and I can go over afterward? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so like you said, they there were like 38 people along the way who, you know, stopped them, talked to them, saw them, thought something was wrong, you know, that sort of thing. I know that, I know you don't really like to go into what actually happened to the victim, but with this one, I feel like in order to understand how evil they are, <laughs> you have to talk a oh, little yeah. bit about that. And I definitely do, but you know, sometimes it's a little too much information. Mm -hmm. I try to stop before I don't I just don't want to upset anyone. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable. But yes, it's definitely necessary just to understand how crazy these children were. Oh my gosh, yeah. And and <sighs> the media, I believe, the coverage of them going into the trial and everything, they were already branded as evil, demonic, monsters, fiends, all that kind of stuff. And they were publicly named, which yes. was the craziest part. That's the part that I was so... I, I had to take a step back, like, are you kidding me? Because at first they were naming them as Child A and Child B, and then they right. publicly named them in the media, and I'm like, these are children. Like, at that point, I think at the trial point, they had just turned 11 or something. So yeah. they were still the youngest to ever be convicted of murder yeah and they're being in like named. 250 <sighs> years in england yeah it's insane yeah and they named them which yeah so then they went so yeah the 38 people saw them and you know i did hear that james bulger had like a freaking giant goose egg on his forehead mm -hmm. and he was crying for most of this journey so you know, it, it's 1993. You just yeah. don't assume two 10-year-olds are taking this kid to murder him. So, I mean, you can't... Yeah, I feel true. bad placing so much blame on people because it's like, even especially back then, but this is pre-Columbine. That's you know, true. You just don't didn't have those assumptions that a child would have that intent, you know? Yeah. Looking at it from that angle, I can see that for but sure. But it's so sad. It is. And I feel like... I mean, I know I, I I don't know what I would do if I was in that position and I saw that, but looking now where I am, I'd be like, okay, something doesn't seem right. Maybe I'll just call the cops since they won't, you know, Definitely. allow me to help because I wouldn't. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's because of cases like this. You exactly. know what I mean? Yeah. So you know, back then, the I probably wouldn't have. Part. Yeah, you just wouldn't have that assumption, especially that a 10-year-old would beat a 2-year-old to death accidentally shoot not watch them and they accidentally drown or mm -hmm. something you know they go in the street on accident but not intentional malicious beating mm -hmm. it, it's unfathomable yeah so once they uh lured him away from his mom she was like paying for groceries or something i believe and yeah. they lured him away like you said they took him to the train tracks they even took him up the embankment to get to the train tracks and they carried him up there. Eden. Yeah. Goodness sakes. I know. There was so much planning to this. And I, I believe it was Venable said that Thompson had mentioned something like, oh, let's do this to kill him. Oh, let's drown him. Let's throw him in the street and pretend like it was an accident or let's throw him on the right. train tracks. So they were already planning out. We have to make it look like an accident. So they knew it was wrong. Uh, then the thing that was really disturbing to me, too, during the trial is the fact that they brought an entire box of evidence in that had like 27 bricks in it, bloodstained yeah. stones, debris. The 22 pound iron bar. Oh my God. Yeah. It's insane. <laughs> and then they tried to make the jurors hold all this stuff. And there was a female juror who was like, get that away from me. Like, how could you shove that in somebody's right. face? You know what I mean? Right. Goodness. Oh. Yeah. And they evidently to like, you know, what led to them getting caught was that they had model paint, like for cars or airplanes, you know, kid mm -hmm. stuff. But they poured it all over him. They poured it in his eyes. And consequently, they got it on themselves. <laughs> so 
it was the news reports in the media with the blue paint and then a neighbor of the Thompson family, I believe, was out of town and she came back and saw the CCV footage, you know, heard the thing about the blue paint and saw one of the kids with blue paint on their clothes and she went to the police. And that's the only reason why they were able to figure out who did this. Because from the CCV footage, they thought that the perpetrators were between the ages of 12 and 18. That's a huge like, gap. <laughs> it is a huge gap. And so for them to be 10, and they said they even looked like they were eight. Yeah, they looked really, they look really young. I'm looking at their pictures right now. They look oh, yeah. so young, like babies. One cherubic, one angelic. Yep. It's amazing. Yeah. And that's how they were described, too, as some of the people that had interacted with them. They said... They had innocent smiles and angelic voices and saying that he was their younger brother. Really? And they, <laughs> and they concocted some pretty wild stories to go along with that. One, one of the witnesses was saying that one of them was just complaining and complaining, like, I'm tired of looking after my little brothers. I'm going to tell my parents I'm not going to do it anymore. Just all kinds of bull crap. Jeez. So but harmless. at least, you know... They they got to trial and they were convicted mm -hmm. of murder. Yes. So you would think, okay, that sounds great. Right. Yeah, you that sounds think. appropriate, convicted mm -hmm. of murder. Mm -hmm. So they were 11 or 12. So then they were incarcerated in the juvenile facilities until the age of 18, mm -hmm. not even 21 years old. Right. Yeah, I remember reading somewhere it said... They were the youngest to be convicted of murder and that they would have a minimum of eight years, but they were to be detained in custody for an infinite term until it was agreed that they had been rehabilitated and would no longer be a threat to the public. Right. So that happened when they were both 18. And they there was health professionals. They drew up reports saying that their risk of reoffending was low that they had made exceptional progress, they had never been violent, they had worked hard at their studies and had had considerable achievements while locked up. And they weren't locked up together. They were locked up in two separate places, secure children's homes. Hmm. So, and you know, James Bulger's mother was pretty pissed off when she realized that in a secure children's home, that pretty much just means you're locked in and locked out. But it was pretty much just like a foster home on the inside. Really? Like a group home situation. Yeah, they had video games. In one of the shorts I watched, um, they spoke to, and it was filmed in about 2010. They spoke to a woman who worked in the um, the Red Bank Secure Children's Home in Liverpool where John Venables had stayed. And she was saying that in England, liberty, which is what they call freedom, I got a real kick out of reading all this British stuff. Yeah. I thought, I was like, this is pretty cool. But she said, you know, freedom, people think that freedom is literally not being able to do anything, but they consider their lack of freedom being the fact that they're locked in and locked out of this facility. But while they're in there, they still treat them like children. So I'm not sure if that's the best rehabilitative experience. So, you know, they came out when they were 18 and there's two of them. So there's a 50-50 chance of success, I would say. Mm -hmm. Robert Thompson, surprisingly, even though they tried to brand him as the ringleader, as the evil one, you know, he didn't show any emotion. He's actually, as far as we can tell, because, you know, they were released at, they went into juvenile custody with a new identity because the media had already outed them who they were. So they had to enter custody with new identities. That's what so I was going to ask you about. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. So not only did they have to grapple with being in prison, deal with the fact that they killed someone, but they also have to learn a new backstory mm -hmm. and become a different person. They went in with new identities, came out at 18, went into hiding. So pretty much the terms of their release and their sentencing were that they would be given new identities and the government would pretty much hide them for the rest of their lives. What? Like so that other people couldn't harm them, basically? Well, they gave they give them support. Yeah, pretty much. They, well, they have to keep their identities secret now because they let their identities slip out. OK, so they literally had teams of people who helped them learn their legacy stories. OK, like 
So they had things to tell people Mm -hmm. and they created fake documents. I mean, as far as you could go. So they come out, you know, they're well entrenched in their new identities by the time they're 18. And by 2006, so they came out in 2004. 